Well, good evening. Good to see you. Well done for fighting your way through the <coughs> rain and the wind and uh, the Arctic conditions. Well, we're here anyway. So, well done. Good job. Uh, please do take out your message outline and uh, encourage you to take notes and uh, pull out uh, your Bible. Turn to Luke chapter 20 and verses 1 through 8. Uh, our next passage uh, as we're working our way through the Gospel of Luke. And uh, just to remind you, just to help you, uh, we are now moving forward. We are now in the final week of Jesus' life as he heads towards the cross. That's where we are at. That's where we are on a sort of the time frame of things. And as you've noticed over the, uh, certainly perhaps over the last few weeks, things are beginning to ramp up uh, as Jesus is getting nearer and nearer to the cross. And we will see that this evening, particularly as we look at this passage. Now, this passage, Luke 20, verses 1 through 8, is all about the issue of authority. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, they challenge Jesus with a question about authority. Verse 2, <clears throat> tell us, they ask, tell us by what authority you're doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? And that's a really important question because these Jewish leaders have put their finger on this subject, this whole question of authority and specifically the authority of Jesus Christ. Now that's a really important question that we need to grapple with in today's society. Because there is no doubt that things are as they are in the church in the UK today because the religious authority has disappeared. Certainly the authority has disappeared in the church, it's disappeared in the country. If you think about it, the pulpits of this country, even 50 or 60 years ago, were fairly influential. But today we are faced with masses of people outside the church who are utterly indifferent to what preachers say. Uh, preachers, pastors, whatever you want to call us, uh, we are seen as irrelevant. We have nothing to say to society today. That's what society thinks. And therefore, there are many people outside the church who think nothing of it. And things are like this because the church has, in one way or another, lost its authority. And as a result, people have ceased to listen or pay attention to, to its message. Now, added to that, and added to the issues with the church and all sorts of things going on, Alongside that, there is this opposition to confessions of faith, to doctrinal statements. In other words, biblical truth itself can be questioned. The fact is, is that the Bible isn't authoritative in many people's minds, and therefore you can question it. Uh, there is no such thing as absolute authoritative truth. And therefore, the modern view is that every approach is right, no one can claim a monopoly. There are many ways to get into heaven, and therefore we must welcome all insights and all beliefs. Which is an illogical viewpoint, even if you, if you remove the religious element to it, but that is what we are in as a society today. We mustn't say, for example, that a person doesn't have the truth, because the very nature of truth itself can never be defined. We can't confidently speak of something being right or wrong today, can we? Even the things, even the moral stance that maybe even a few years ago people said, no, that's wrong, today can be questioned, can't it? We are living in a postmodern age. It claims not only that truth cannot be defined, but that truth is unattainable because it can't be defined. No one has the authority to declare that one view is right and another view is wrong. There are no longer absolutes, and the result of this error is that there's no such thing where you can say, well, look, that is the truth, or that is an objective authority. That doesn't exist today in many people's minds. Anything goes, doesn't it? So a person's search, therefore, for truth, for these realities, is useless and it's disappeared because it's believed that it's actually simply arrogant for anyone to claim, I have the truth. People are going to say, well, who do you think you are? How come you can say that? But here's the interesting thing. And if you study church history, and you should study church history, by the way, that's why I think last year or the year before we did a whole thing on church history. You should know church history because if you study church history, and particularly if you really want to be encouraged, study the periods of revival, above anything else, the church spoke with authority. The great characteristic of all revivals was this air of power and courage that possessed the main preachers involved they seem to enter into a new dimension of, of certainty. The Spirit of God got hold of preachers and they preached powerfully the gospel, the word of God. There, there was something extra and irresistible about their ministries as they declared the mighty works of God. 
So this subject of authority is important for us to understand today because, as I said this morning, we need to understand the unique nature of Christ. There is no such thing, the Bible certainly doesn't believe this, that every road leads to heaven. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you ultimately get there at some point. It's not true. And therefore, this subject of authority is the one great theme of the Bible itself. And this particular incident, Jesus is being confronted by these religious leaders, asking him by what authority he is acting and speaking, and it's recorded for us, in fact, in the three synoptic Gospels. And the frequent response of men and women, and we've seen this over the weeks and months, years, in fact, as we've been studying Luke's Gospel, one of the main responses that when people heard Jesus preach, when they heard his message they clearly saw his authority was on display. Uh, They were amazed at his authority when he addressed them because they would often say, well, where did he get this authority? He doesn't speak like any other teacher. And so they would ask these questions, and these questions were motivated by curiosity, but that's not what these religious leaders were doing, asking their question here to Jesus in Luke chapter 20 because their question was very sinister. Their question was a trap. In fact, this is a sad conversation because it's the final declaration on the part of Jesus that he has nothing more to say to these religious leaders of Israel. He's finished with them, basically. And the issue that brings up this tragic final declaration by Jesus is the issue of authority. So there's four things I want you to notice as we go through this. But let me start with the first one. And first of all, how Jesus understood authority. So let me just set the scene a little bit for you, and let's just back up before we look at the passage that we're going to look at, because we need to think about what what does Jesus think about his own authority? Now, let's be honest, we do understand the word authority, even though we're living in a society that wants to redefine authority, wants to declare there's no such thing like that, deep down we still know what it is, don't we? We understand what it is to be in authority, we understand what it is to be under authority, Authority means permission, it means power, it means privilege, it means rule, it means control, it means dominion. And our world is filled with it. We face it in our homes, don't we? Fathers and mothers are given authority over their children. Uh, We face it in our uh, schools. There are those over us in authority in our schools. We face it in our workplaces. We face it in terms of governments that are responsible to make laws and enforce them with authority. So, So we're used to it. We understand authority. We get it. We also know what it means to be under authority. But here's the thing. When it comes to Jesus, authority is a very different reality for him. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. This is what it means to be absolutely sovereign. This is what it means to answer to no one outside of yourself to have all authority. And Jesus demonstrates his authority in a number of ways. In Matthew 7, 28 to 29, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus has preached this this incredible, masterful evangelistic sermon, which began by dismantling the false religion of Judaism and ended in an invitation to enter the narrow way, the people's response was this. Notice, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. That was absolutely unique. They weren't, used to people who were, they, were, they weren't used to people who were their own authority. They were used to people who would quote somebody else, and they'd say, well, such and such thinks this, and such and such thinks this, and so on and so forth. They identified themselves with a train of uh, thought or with a certain sort of belief system. Uh, they drew their authority from somebody else. But when Jesus spoke, he spoke as one who is an authority. Later on in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus heals a paralyzed man, we read in Matthew 9, verses 6 to 8, it says, But so that you know the Son of Man, and remember, the Son of Man was the favorite term that Jesus uses to describe himself. So so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and he went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to men. And authority, they understood, belonged only to God. In Matthew 10, verse 1, it becomes apparent that Jesus has authority over all forces of hell. He has authority over demon power. We've certainly seen that, haven't we, as we've looked through Luke's Gospel. 
In John 1.12, he claimed authority to save. That is, he, gives, he has authority to give life. He has spiritual life and salvation. In John 5.27, it says that he has given authority to judge all people. And in John 10, 17 to 18, he said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. That is to say, he had authority over death and authority over life, expressed wonderfully in Revelation as having the keys to death and Hades. Jesus has authority over all of humanity. He is not under anyone but God. And he is in perfect agreement with God as God. He has authority. So to have all authority then is to have all power and all right to do everything and anything one wills to do. He has the ability to do whatever he wants. He has the right to do whatever he wants and with whoever or whatever he wants. This is having all authority. He has the power. He has the permission. He has it because he is God. And even though he is incarnate, even though he is God in human flesh, even though he has lowered himself as a servant, he still has the power and authority to do precisely what God wills him to do. There are no limits to his power. No one can withstand his power. There are no limits to his ability. There are no limits to his right. He has both the right and the ability to do everything he wills to do, and he wills to do what is in perfect harmony with his Father. Jesus was his own authority. He spoke prophetically. He spoke truly. He rightly interpreted the Old Testament scripture. He spoke the true word of God. He forgave sin. He healed sick people. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. And he did it without ever asking permission from anyone else, didn't he? And the bottom line is this. He treated the entire Jewish religious system as if it was non-existent. He didn't care about the Sanhedrin. He didn't care about the chief priests. He didn't care about their councils. He didn't care about popular opinion. He was totally indifferent to the priests, to the rabbis, to the lawyers, the scribes, the theologians. He was indifferent to the sacrificial system in the temple. He treated it as if it was non-existent. It had no bearing on his life. It had no bearing on what he taught. It had no bearing on what he said. In fact, he attacked it. And that was absolutely shocking in the experience of these Jewish leaders. And that's why you have to understand that the mounting hostility towards Jesus at this point is really immeasurable. Their Jewish leaders lived to be elevated. These leaders lived to wear long robes and tassels on their robes and pretend holiness. They lived to fast in public, to put ashes on their head, to make donations in the temple in full view of everyone, while someone was blowing a trumpet to announce their arrival. They sought the chief seats while some are in the higher places and to be elevated and be called master and teacher and father and rabbi and all those sorts of things. It was all about elevating them. And Jesus literally treated them with disdain. As far as he was concerned, they were non-existent. They had nothing to do with God or with the kingdom of God. They had nothing to do with the true people of God. They were alien to the purposes of God and the life of God. Now, there's nothing more devastating and hard to swallow than being treated as if you don't matter, isn't there? When you think you really do. Wow, that hits your pride, doesn't it? And add all the elements of this together and there is a rage inside of them to the degree that their souls are literally on fire with the flames of hatred. And it's escalating rapidly. And it explodes in an infernal, inferno on crucifixion on Friday. So that leads me to the second point now. We'll get to the passage now, which is a hostile question. We understand how Jesus sees his own authority Now we need to look at this hostile question that comes at him because let me just remind you of the setting. Let me just place you where where we're at. Remember, Jesus has ended his Galilean ministry after ministering in Judea predominantly in the last year of his life. So he has come down to the Passover in Jerusalem. He arrived in Jerusalem on Saturday, AD 30, in preparation for dying on the Friday, which is the day that the Passover lambs are slain. So he is the true Passover lamb, isn't he? He would be slain on that day. 
He arrives in Jerusalem area. He goes to the family he knows and loves, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He stays in their house in the village called Bethany, two miles east of Jerusalem. He stays there with them Saturday night. On Sunday, the word comes out, the word's out there that he is there. Massive crowds come out of the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding villages, and they come to Bethany to see him, to see Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus has been risen, uh, take, uh, been made alive by Christ. He's been raised from the grave, uh, from the dead several weeks earlier. That's what happened on Sunday. That's all explained in John's Gospel, by the way. Then on Monday, he, rode, he rides triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem on a colt, on the foal of a donkey, to fulfill Zechariah 9, verse 9, that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He comes through the eastern gate. He is greeted by this massive crowd as the Messiah. The great parade then ends at the temple, which is just inside the eastern gate, and he's right there at the temple site. Monday ends then at the temple. It's the evening, so he leaves Jerusalem, he works his way back through the crowd, returns to Bethany to spend the night with Mary, Martha and Lazarus and his apostles. Tuesday, he comes back in the morning in holy anger. The last sight that he had on Monday night was the temple. And as he comes through the eastern gate, after the triumphal entry, he looked at the temple, he would have seen that the robbers, what they were doing, they were in that place, they were in God's house, and in holy anger, he comes in and he throws them out. He says they are robbers, that they are wicked. They desecrate his father's house. And of course, well, this isn't going to endear himself to the religious leaders, is it? In fact, it further incenses the leaders. And so they escalate the necessity to murder him, to stop this desecration of their, their sanctimonious religion. They cannot tolerate Jesus, who has overthrown their false worship, who's unmasked their hypocrisy and done what he's done without their permission. Wow, you had to ask their permission to do anything. Jesus ignores that. Why? Because he has all authority. Now, after cleansing the temple on Tuesday, he goes back to Bethany. On Wednesday, he returns. So in chapter 20, verse 1, it's Wednesday. He returns again to the city. He comes back into the temple, which is now clean. Uh, those who were the sellers, they don't come back. And that speaks of the power that he wielded, isn't, doesn't it? He comes to his temple, and he comes there to teach, verse 1. One day, as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel. Well, it's time for some real truth in the temple now, isn't it? It's time for, the, for God's true teacher, for God's true word, and God's true gospel of salvation. It's a time for the real good news. And so he comes, and he becomes the center of attention. By the way, back in chapter 19, verses 47 to 48, it said this. Every day he was teaching at the temple... But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. And they continue to do this in their few days. They hang on his words because if you look at chapter 21 and verses 37 to 38, each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. So this was his daily routine, just for the last few days. So he would have done this on Wednesday, on Thursday for certain, <clears throat> and Friday, well, of course, the events of his trial take place and eventually his crucifixion. So here on this Wednesday, he comes back to this temple, back to bring the truth to a place where there's been nothing but lies. He comes teaching the people in the temple and he preaches the gospel. Now, by the way, this is grace. This is compassion. This is mercy, because in the final few days, he's calling Israel to repentance. He's calling them to salvation. He knows what's going to happen, but grace is at work here because he calls them to respond. Now, what was his message? He is the Messiah. Was it about politics? No. And it wasn't about those things that the people wanted the Messiah to bring to them. It was about the issues of the kingdom. And he probably talked about sin. We, we know that. We've heard Jesus preach the gospel as we've studied Luke's gospel. We know him speak about the kingdom of God. And as he speaks about the kingdom of God, he speaks about sin. He talks about the wretchedness of it. He talks about the madness of hypocritical religion, which couldn't deal with that sin. He probably talked about judgment, the certainty of divine judgment and hell. Probably talked about righteousness, about the hopelessness of trying to achieve righteousness on your own, doing your own good works. I'm sure he talked about humility, the need for brokenness of spirit and a contrite heart. 
He talked about the compassionate God who has a love for sinners. He talked about the possibility of peace with God, about entering into the kingdom of God and having eternal life and the hope of heaven, the hope of glory. He talked about all the matters that had to do with salvation. And while he did it, the leaders were always there, weren't they? Always trailing him, and they listened, but they couldn't take it because they were just looking for some way to get him. They were looking for a way to trap him. But they're having a really hard time to do that, hard time trying to do that, aren't they? However, at the end of chapter 19, it didn't take long for them to do for them to do something because they were so infuriated. They confront Jesus with a hostile question in chapter 20, verse 1. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Now, it means to attack. That's what it really is the idea here. It means to come upon. It means to sort of pounce on. That's the sort of idea. Um, that it wasn't just a nice little gentle question, oh, by the way, no, no, no. They can't contain their, their, their outrage. They're trying to restrain themselves. It's almost bubbling inside of them. Uh, and so they do it by forming a question, which really masks their real hostility. In a sort of a, they offer a sort of a theological case, is what they do. But they come after him with a vengeance. Now, notice, have you noticed all the listed names here? Notice it says, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. So it was all of them. So the chief priest would include the high priest, a sort of kind of a, a captain of the priest who had responsibility to oversee just about everything. Uh, then there would be sort of ranking orders of priests, priests who were over priests who would often come and do their two-week service in the temple each week. So there were all kinds of authorities and dignitaries. They're collectively re represented in the chief priest. Then you notice the teachers of the law. Well, that represents the theologians. Uh, many of them would be Pharisees. Not all of them were Pharisees, but many of them were. And the elders would be the remaining ones. So that would be mostly made up of Sadducees and probably, again, some Pharisees and Herodians. They would constitute the Sanhedrin, which would be a group of about 70 men who were the reigning group over the affairs of religion. So the reality is there is this big delegation. Do you see how it's all ramping up? We're in the final days of Jesus' life. They're all pulling out all the stops. They're all there. And by the way, what's really interesting about this is that they were divergent groups because they didn't all believe the same thing. See, the Sadducees, they had their views. The Pharisees also had views, but they were diverse views. The Herodians, well, they had their own views. Uh, they're all very diverse groups, but what do they agree on? One thing, we want this man dead. We want him gone. The whole religious establishment is unified on this account. All divergent groups are all united in the desire to kill Jesus. They couldn't agree on much. They had lots of different views and lots of different things. But they could agree on this. They wanted Jesus dead. By the way, I hope you know this. All false religions have their own diversities. They have all their different views about religion and all these sorts of things. But you know, all false religions agree on one thing. They oppose Jesus Christ. So don't be fooled, seriously. Do not be fooled into getting with, on with dialogue with other religions. They oppose Christ. They oppose the gospel. It doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever you want to, ism you want to call it. In fact, I'd also go on to say false, any false kind of Christianity that doesn't preach Christ, incidentally. All false religions agree on being anti-gospel. This is the greatest attack on the truth. And at the end of the age, all world religions will unite against Christ. So please, don't be fooled. It might look all lovely and cosy and let's all get on and let's all tolerate one another. Rubbish. It's not what the Bible teaches. So here you have an example of a modern day example, don't you, really? All these diverse groups, different views, and yet they're united. They want Jesus dead. And so the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the, the elders all collectively come together to be against Christ. And they're such cowards, though, they really don't know how to handle this deal. They don't want to reveal the truth of their own attitudes and of their minds and their hearts and their own convictions. So they think, we'll be a bit clever here. We'll trap Jesus with a question. Verse 2, tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? Now, let me just give you a little bit of a footnote here. 
This is why they asked this question, because they lived in a world where authority was a really big deal. It was a huge thing. There was this very complex pyramid hierarchy, really. So there were people in charge of festivals and people in charge of music and trumpets and bakeries and salt and wood and drink offerings and casting locks and burnt offerings and water and stuff. Ah, oh, you name it. There was like people in charge of all sorts of stuff. It was ridiculous. And there was this pecking order from top to bottom all the way up to the high priest and under him would be the captain of the temple who was next in rank. And then you'd have all these other ranking people. So they were really into this whole deal of authority. And you just didn't move unless you had authority. And they all collectively come together and they can agree on, this, on this, this, this outrageous man who is doing outrageous things, who pays no attention to them. And I think the question they need to ask is a question about authority. Because they think, they think that the people will understand this. Tell us by what authority you're doing these things. Now, the question is, well, what things? What other things are they talking about? Well, some have suggested teaching, the things that Jesus taught, and you could say that, that's a fair point, because you couldn't teach in the temple unless you had been ordained by the Sanhedrin. Well, Jesus hadn't, had he? He didn't care, he just taught. Some people think it was the miracles that he did, and that, again, could be true, and there's probably elements to that as well, but actually, it's not the issue here. What calls them to ask this question is the cleansing of the temple. Remember what's just happened? That's these things. How dare you take over this place, they're asking. These things, meaning the triumphal entry, the claim that you are willing to be accepted as the Messiah. You come in, you clean the place out, then you take it over. By what authority are you doing this? You want to know where he got his permission to do this? That's what they want to know. By what authority? Who gave this to you? How, how dare you do this? Now, everybody understood that. All the people understood that there were rules and there were elements of authority that had to be consulted. They also knew that Jesus always claimed his authority was from God. Remember, he'd, already, he'd always said that. He would say, I do what my father tells me to do. I do what my father shows me to do. I do the will of my father. How many times has he said that? I think the religious hoped he would say, well, I have my authority from God, to which they would have responded, blasphemer, blasphemer, and they would have stoned him. And so they ask this hostile question, and Jesus' response exposes them for who they really are. Because here's the really cool thing. Thirdly, here we see a counter question. And I love this when you look at Jesus, you know. I'm only, I, I mean, Jesus is God, so that's why he's really clever, obviously. Um, but don't miss this. They ask their hostile question, and Jesus isn't on the ropes. Because in verse 3, Jesus asks a counter question, doesn't he? Notice, he replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me. Now, this is a traditional rabbinical style. You answer a question with a question to force the student deeper into the issue, to deeper into the dilemma. And Jesus is not evading the answer here, by the way. He's, uh, he's actually unmasking their hypocrisy. They knew where his authority has come from because he said it many, many times. They know that. They're just trying to get him to say it so that he, they can accuse him of blasphemy and then they can kill him. But instead of answering their question, he exposes their hypocrisy. They're supposed to be the great teachers of Israel. They're supposed to know all the answers to all the issues, remember? Remember? They're supposed to be the leads of the people. They're, says, they're supposed to know all the spiritual, theological issues. So he says, hey, let me ask you a question. And by the way, Jesus did, did that a lot. Um, he did that in chapter 5. He did it in chapter 6. He did it in chapter 11. And he'll also do it further on in chapter 20, where he answers a question with a question. So he says this, verse 4. He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Now, everybody knew who John was, and we're talking about John the Baptist. Remember, the prophet who was out in the wilderness of the Jordan River, baptizing people with a baptism of repentance, preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah. That's what John's baptism was. So John prepares people for the coming Messiah by calling for baptism. Come out here, he would say, confess your sins, symbolically go into the water, symbolising a cleansing from sins as you prepare your own heart for the coming of the Messiah. 
and all Judea flocks out to John. These people are all being baptized because they want to be ready when the Messiah comes. One day Jesus shows up. Remember, we've looked at this. John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John baptizes Jesus. The voice of the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The baptism of John, Jesus is using the word baptism here. It speaks of John's whole prophetic ministry. It's not just talking about the actual act of baptism. So when Jesus says, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men, he's actually saying the ministry of John, the work of John, the prophetic ministry of John, his call for repentance and baptism was asking a Jew to say, you have to treat yourself as if you are a Gentile because this was a kind of baptism that was used when Gentiles wanted to join the Jews in their worship because they were outsiders. And so therefore there was this ritual that they had to go through. He's saying, look, you have to treat yourself as a Jew as if you were an outcast Gentile and confess your sin and repent of your sin and go through a ceremonial demonstration of it. This is the baptism of John. That's what it meant. In order to be ready for the Messiah, John points to Jesus as the Messiah. And you can read that back in Luke chapter 3, which we must have done about 10 years ago. But it's all there in detail, isn't it? So the question's pretty simple, really. Was this work of men, or was it of God? Simple question. Did it come from heaven or from men? Now, here's the thing. This is where Jesus is really clever. This is an impossible dilemma for them, isn't it? Remember, he's showing their, their hostility. He's showing their hypocrisy. See, they want to say it came from men, but that's problematic for them. They do not want to say it came from God. They don't believe that. They hate that idea. In fact, to show you that, back in Luke chapter 7, they're on record as taking a position on John the Baptist. Verses 29 to 30, all the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. So the people all went out, they all went through this baptism saying, yes, we want to be ready, yes, we want to confess our sins and repent, we want to be there when Jesus, when this Messiah comes to set up the kingdom. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptised by John. They rejected it. They weren't going to do it. That would have been an admission that they were outside the covenant and they were outside the kingdom. That they were not holy. No way would they do that. So they rejected John. But Jesus puts them on this horns of a dilemma. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? So they're stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place, aren't they? You either admit that Jesus is the Messiah or you deny that John the Baptist is a prophet of God. Now, they can't admit that Jesus is the Messiah, can they? That's impossible. Well, here's the thing. They better not deny that John is a prophet because that has serious consequences. Verses 5 and 6. They discussed it among themselves. That The Greek word means to deliberate, really, to get into this. You can imagine. I don't know how long they took, but they really discussed it. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? If John is a prophet of God who had a ministry from heaven, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you believe him when he said, Jesus is the Messiah, is what it means. But if we say from men, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. Now, why would they stone them to death? Well, for blasphemy. They would reach, the people would reach back into the Old Testament, places like Exodus 17 verse 4 and Numbers 14 verse 10, and they would accuse them of blasphemy by calling a prophet of God not a prophet of God, and the results of that would be that you would be stoned. You cannot go against a prophet of God. That's what was written there. So they've got a real problem here, haven't they? If we say it's from heaven, then we have no excuse for believing in Jesus as the Messiah. If we say it's from men, well, they're going to stone us to death. Now, you can get from this the fever pitch of the crowd, can't you? This lets you know how volatile the crowd was in terms of their temporary excitement about Jesus. The leaders can't tell the truth, so what do they do? <laughs> Verse 7, so they answered, we don't know where it was from. They give no answer. What a cop-out. So much for their pretend knowledge. It was their duty to be observers of truth in matters of religion. So what do they do? They shoot themselves in the foot because they're unwilling to answer the question. We don't know. 
There is no way they can escape the dilemma. See how clever Jesus is? But Jesus is not finished because there's one final thing, and it's the final point, really. There is the judgment statement by Jesus. I don't know if you realize that, but their hostile question led to a counter question by Jesus, and then it ends in condemnation. And this is one of those really sad statements that often appear in the Bible, and particularly when Jesus is engaging with these religious leaders. It's a sad statement. Verse 8, Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. That's tragic. Because Jesus is essentially saying, based on what you've done with the information that you have, um, I'm not giving you any more. It's over. While teaching the people and preaching the gospel to the people, he has absolutely nothing to say to these leaders. They knew the ministry of John. He, they knew Jesus claimed that he, as well as John, came from God. John and Jesus were inseparable. You take one, you get them both. They willfully rejected all the light. There's no reason to give them any more. This is judgment on, religious, on the religious leadership of Israel. And actually, very interesting, later on in Luke 22, verses 66 to 71, when Jesus is on trial, we read these words. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. So there they are again. Here is this same group. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you are right in saying, I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Kill him, in other words. It doesn't do any good to tell them anything. They are so fixed in their unbelief, this is judgment. This is Genesis 6, verse 3, where God says, my spirit will not contend with man forever. There is an end to God's patience, you know. I think people forget that. People think, well, God is just God, and he'll just put up with what's going on, and, you know, God is always patient, and it doesn't really matter. No, no, no. There comes a time when God says, I have nothing more to say to you. That's a terrifying thing to think about. Remember Luke 19, 41 to 42? As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. That is a word of judgment. I mean, to the people, there is still mercy extended, the gospel is extended, the message is extended. And we know that on the day of Pentecost there will be 3,000 people who believe and thousands more after that. But for the, the, the leaders, the religious leaders of Israel, it is over. And even after the resurrection, remember, he rises from the dead. They still will not believe, will they? They make up a lie to cover it up, don't they? They are hardened in their unbelief. See, I would think, even in a congregation like this, there are those who are like the people, that the Lord is still reaching out to you. He's still telling you, he's still tugging on your heart to accept Christ. And yet there are those who are like the leaders, the door is shutting for good. How many times can you hear the gospel and reject the gospel before the Lord says, I have nothing more to say to you? Don't let that happen. Do not let that happen. Make sure that your knowledge of the Christ who is crucified is personal, that it is intimate, that it is life transforming. Let's pray together. And our Father, we recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ has all authority. Your word tells us that time and time again. Your word tells us that one day everyone will need to reckon with that because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, every knee will bow. Everyone will recognize that Jesus is who he said he is and they will bow to his authority. 
Father, we thank you that if we know you, then that authority is something that we embrace. It is something that we enjoy. It's something that we love. But if we don't, then truly we need to get ourselves right with you because we will bow the knee to that authority. And we bow, would one day bow that knee in, to the authority in regret because Jesus says, I have nothing more to say to you. Away from me, you evildoer. Lord, those are awful words. And we recognize that you are a God of judgment. We recognize that you are patient and long-suffering. But we also know there will come a time when your patience ends and judgment comes. And so, our Father, may we all of us here this evening look at our own hearts, look at our standing before you. May we be in a right relationship with you. But may it also spur us on to be about the gospel, to challenge people, to share Christ with them. We don't have the authority uh, to say who will accept Jesus or who will not. Lord, we recognise that our responsibility is to just tell people about Jesus and to do that constantly, to urge them, to plead with them, as Paul reminds us. But we also know that, at times, patience runs out. Father, we thank you that in a world where people don't believe that there is absolute truth, that there is an objective authority, we thank you that Jesus is that that he has all sovereignty, all power, all might, that he is ruling and reigning, that he is at work. And therefore we thank you that he reigns, that you reign, Lord, and thank you that you reign in this world, but you reign in our lives, and you will fulfill your plans and purposes. Lord, that gives us great confidence, that gives us great joy. It also challenges us to be obedient to the will of you. Help us to do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.